It's not foreign to me to have contact with spirits and have had spirits make my home in my room on multiple occasions. The home I'm currently in has a spirit that moved into my closet. I'm comfortable with him there and he's very kind to me, although we had to learn to live with each other. I do not know his name, but I do associate him with the letter T, so that's why I call him. Meeting T was rather frustrating in the beginning. For an entire week he bothered me. Each night I would start facing away from my closet. Then I would wake from a dead slumber at 3.32 every day. How did I know it was 3.32? I would be overwhelmed with the urge to check the time. I'd wake up and it was as if someone was asking me what the time was. For the first four days I would wake up, check my phone and immediately go back to sleep. But on the fifth night I got frustrated. I knew someone wanted me something at that point. So I picked up my phone, saw the time and said, it's 3.32, let me go back to sleep. I went back to bed and it happened again the next day. Though after this, I got some brains and spoke to my mom about it and decided perhaps I needed a clock in my room. I went into my room and openly discussed this. I often openly speak to spirits to share my feelings. I said, I'll get you a clock and put it on your wall. He hangs out in my closet that has a wall next to it. But you need to stop waking me up or you'll have to leave. I was unable to get him a clock for that wall, but I did set up a dream catcher my aunt made on his wall. I was worried it would make him leave, but since he seemed more content. He was content for a long time after this. That was until a second very malevolent spirit entered my home. He very close friend M lived in a very pure home. The home only had innocent energy until she had a roommate moved in who was very negative. Her home was very well protected in faith though, different from mine, but faiths of all kind have protection. While there, we discussed spiritual encounters and she told me about a time she was little. When she'd stay at her grandmother's, she would be awoken and overcome with anxiety and a sense of doom. She'd run up to her grandmother and would then bless her and pray over her. Her grandmother would hold her and have her say, I'm covered in the blood of Christ and then send her back off to bed. She was a very religious woman who grew up in a religious cult that was visited by man spirits, but this had always kept her protected. I went home and a week or so later, I began waking up in the middle of the night and the corner of my room where T and my closet were began to give me horrendous anxiety. I told T I would like to sleep, gave him the time and went back to bed. But I continued to have this horrendous feeling when going to bed. I began to dread the middle of the night. Eventually, I was visited by this malevolent spirit. I didn't have any association with it, but we will call it R in my dreams. I had a dream that I woke up in my bed, all very realistic, everything in place, no distortion. I got up from my bed and walked to my living room. I don't know why I did. I had a poor feeling about it. Well, I got into my living room and there was this indistinguishable figure in my living room and I wanted to the nook from my room. I ran into my room and grabbed onto me and began to speak or screech. It was terrible and terrifying. When it grabbed me though, I got the urge to do what my friend's grandmother had taught me. I began screaming, I am covered in the blood of Christ. After I did this, it dropped me. I thought it was over. It then grabbed me again and began to mock me saying the same thing. I'm not religious in the sense of believing in Jesus and whatnot. But this had made my stomach sick. It was as if whatever while R was mocking me and the mere thought of a higher power such as Christ. I woke up and was sweaty, catching my breath and just overall terrified. For the next few days, I was unable to sleep on my bed. I was having to sleep on my floor. Spiritual activity happens at an average of three feet, which in the average height of a bed. Every day I told R to leave and that it was not welcome. I didn't contact or interact with me again, but I still kept it up in fears it would. Eventually it left. No feelings of it were left. I didn't, f I didn't tell my friend M about it for weeks because I knew it would scare her. But the thing I'm most upset about in this situation is T doesn't interact with me as much as he used to. I still sense him there every so often, but I'm afraid that R scared him. Whatever R was, it was trying to move in and take over T's neutral space.
So this happened four years ago, when I, 19, female, was 15. It was my sophomore year of high school, and one of my friends, we'll call A, invited me to go camping over spring break with her family, mom, dad, baby brother and sister, and another friend, we'll call S, in Anza Borrego. Important, my entire life I've always had paranormal experiences, and so did A, so we bonded over this. S didn't believe in ghosts. So we're at this campsite, and it's time for bed. A, S and I shared a tent, while A's parents shared a tent with the little siblings, who were both under five. S fell asleep pretty quickly, but A and I were having a bit more trouble because our tent was very close to the campsite's graveyard. At one point, it felt as though someone came over and was shaking our tent really hard. It wasn't wind, and it wasn't her parents. The rest of the camping trip goes by and nothing too creepy happens, except swings that would swing by themselves, until the morning we left. S and I were getting ready together in the campsite bathroom, which was up the dirt path from our tents. Then it sounded like someone was walking up the dirt path and stopped right in front of the door. Whoever walked up then let out a very shallow, ragged breath, and then a voice that honestly didn't even sound human said, I see you. Both the breath and what this thing said echoed throughout the bathroom. S and I looked at each other, obviously scared as hell, grabbed our stuff and decided to make a break for it. But when we opened the door, nobody was there. In the dirt path, you could only see two pairs of footprints, S and mine. We still ran back to where A and her family were, and they were finishing packing up the supplies. We asked all of them if they've played a prank on us, and they all said no. A's dad then told us, on the last day of the trip, literally as we were leaving, Oh yeah, apparently this campsite is haunted. I saw it online. And now S believes in ghosts. Campsite is Velocito County Park. <laughs> So my husband and I have always dealt with supernatural type dealings. Since I was a young girl, I've always had that sight of things that weren't necessarily there. Like seeing people in cemeteries or past relatives, or even passing things in the street that disappeared in an instant. Whenever we were first married, we were taunting things that I would see. Like a little gin of a shadow figure that would occasionally show its face. Then we made contact. That's when shit got fucked up, obviously. I'd thought I'd had enough experience in the dead supernatural because I've seen some ring type shit before that would make someone piss their pants. This gift, more like a fucking curse, has been passed to every woman in my family. My family's descended from Thailand, I don't know if that has anything to do with it, but it's just a thing. Every single female has the sight, but my grandmother and I have the most attuned sense. This isn't a brag, this shit sucks. Anyway, so my husband and I have dealt with this shit and we had things flying in our house and physically assaulting us and our animals. Well, we thought since we got sober and stopped doing everything, that things would go away. They did sort of, but I've always been able to see shit, so that never went away. Well, today I was watching a Disney movie with my one-year-old and my dog and my dog's leg gets shot up behind her like she was doing some yoga move. Now, Gaia doesn't freak out over little things. As soon as that happened, she went ridge back and had this low guttural growl and was eyeing the perimeter of the room. Then she went to our hallway. We've seen things down there, but this was different. And she came and stayed next to my daughter and I. I didn't see a thing, which is new and neither did Gaia. I've seen this thing around lately at 3.30 a.m. and 4.44 and 4.45 looming over my husband or expanding itself in the hallway. I don't know, like its back is on its one of the side of the hallway and it lays its forehead on the other side. I don't necessarily feel danger, but I want to be prepared in case of anything tried to go after my kid. I am not afraid to get a priest up in this bitch. I'm not Christian, but I'll do anything because do this shit, I'll be its worst nightmare if it touches my daughter. There are multiple things in the house. It's an old house where I feel multiple things. Some things have interacted with her before, but always shushed her away and tried to distract her. This thing has made contact though, and no one felt it appear. Which is what frightens me. My mum's family and my father lived in this old country home at varying points. 
It's how they met. My dad was moving out and my grandmother was moving in with all her kids. The house is on top of a mountain in a very rural southwest Virginia. The old tradition about the mountain, as told by my dad, was that the Native Americans said it was tainted or marked by bad medicine. Sudden weather events were common on the mountain. Thunderstorms, snowstorms, hail. Dad rented the house with roommates while in college and told me stories of when he lived there, before he met my mom. He claims that he heard bootsteps on the floor when he was home alone. He would often hear footfalls on the stairwell when no one was there. He would hear what sounded like vague or distant conversations. He described it as how it sounded when a phone call bleeds out into another call, just carrying on a conversation. Dad would occasionally see an old man walking with a cane, usually out of the corner of his eye. My mom, before marrying my dad and living in the house with my brother and grandma, would occasionally see figures briefly moving past the windows on the porch outside. My older brother, when he was very little, used to tell my mom about the man who lived in the root cellar. My mom said that was before I was born. My brother was afraid to play outside alone. After I was born, my mom once left me in the crib upstairs, when after a time, she heard me wailing, like I was in pain. The crying abruptly stopped when she entered the room and found me sound asleep. One of my parents heard an old wind-up style record player spontaneously start playing music. My mom and dad encountered an amorphous, shimmering, but kind of transparent cloud in the middle of the bath bedroom once. It stuck around for a few seconds and dissipated. I have a few personal experiences of my own, but as I get older, the actual events seem fuzzier and more vague. As a preteen, me and some of my cousins were playing what we called roof ball. We threw a ball on the tin roof and scrambled to catch it when it rolled off. On one throw, there was a pale face perfectly framed in the attic window. A cousin and I were once playing in the woods behind the house. My cousin was leading us through the trees, when I heard heavy and fast footfalls right behind me, like someone was running up on us. When I spun around, the sound abruptly stopped and there was nothing there. My mom's sister and I flew in from out of state to spend Christmas with the family when I was a teenager. I stayed in the smallest bedroom upstairs and woke up to motion across the room. It looked like some kind of slinking in the closet. A very brief thing. Stayed on a pull-out bed in the same room as my mom and sister for the rest of the trip. The house was neat, very old, even when my parents were young. It was purchased by a preservation society when I was a young adult, where the house was returned to its original condition. I think it's a wedding or events venue now. But to my family, it was always just an old Appalachian country house. I live in a suburb of LA. So it's a small street with houses up and down the streets, tree-lined sidewalks, and a few street lamps. I remember that I needed to take out the trash to the curb for pickup. When I walked out, I looked up and down the street. No one was there. The street was dark and silent with a breeze that is usual for the area. When I was done, I was surprised to see a teenage girl walking down the sidewalk towards me. The street lights were half a block away and covered by tree branches that moved in the breeze. Because of the lightning, she was in blue tones. She was walking slowly, looking from side to side. By her look, I suspected she might be blonde or redhead, five foot seven, white, peasant blouse, gypsy skirt and sandals. Kind of like a hippie, but I've seen girls dressed this way currently, so it wasn't that out of place. She seemed lost or high, but her presence at this time of night was out of place. When she got within 15 feet, I asked her if she was okay or needed help. She said no, but didn't look at me, then said, I'm looking for my friend's house. It has an alley behind it. I told her all houses here have alleys. She said I'll find it. She never looked at me, just at the houses she also never stopped walking towards me. The tree branches shifted in the breeze and the light ran across her face. At that moment, I realized she had no eyes. I could see into her eye sockets for a moment. She was five feet away at this point and I was frozen in place. All I could say at this point was, do you want me to tell anyone anything or call them as she walked right past me onto the sidewalk? 
She didn't stop or look at me, but said no, I'll find them. Frozen, I watched her walk about 20 feet to the tree where the street lamp was covered and sank into the shadow of the tree trunk on the sidewalk. I made my way home but kept looking out my window for a few hours. I still get nervous when I walk outside around that time. A few years later, a streetlight was installed directly in front of my house, but still, it gives me chills. I was working at a large local government holding facility about 13 years ago. I was overseeing work being done to a farm former ambulance. I was working alone with a mechanic, Pastor Jose. He was an actual pastor that works at our facility. I came back in from a door nearest the left rear corner of the ambulance. I looked down and see Pastor Jose on his back, legs underneath the ambulance car. There was enough clearance to slide under it with a creeper, so it wasn't that strange. The blank look was what struck me. He always had a smile. I said, Jose, I told you where the battery was. He said nothing, but proceeded to slide under the ambulance, the way octopuses move underwater. It was like he was floating off the ground and had no bones. I yelled, Jose, you okay? My mind could only process that he had heard himself so far. After Jose had slid under the ambulance, the real Jose came running from around, the right middle body of the ambulance. He said, what's up, boss? I must have been in utter shock because he walked back to my office not saying anything. I'm sure after the colour came back to my face, I told him that no matter what I said next, he had to be careful and watch himself the next few days. He agreed, but insisted I tell him why I yelled and was so affected. I told him and he was very quiet. He said thank you and was going to take it as a blessing and warning from God. He looked at me like he wanted to tell me something. He was holding back, but never did. I was ending my shift at a maintenance facility for a local government. On clear at night, one can see the whole LA basin, out of Signal Hill and Santa Monica Pier. Some contractors came to me and asked me for some general features of the building. It's a huge building that has large warehouse sized rooms within it. I showed the electric panels and other things for my area. They were going to install a new fire alarm system in the whole building. It was going to take three weeks, and they were going to work overnight shifts while no one else was working. Most of the crew was Spanish speaking, with very limited English speaking abilities. Not a problem for me, as I'm fluent in Spanish. I bid them farewell and went home. The next day, I saw the supervisor ask me about some lady that was working at night. He wanted me to ask what it was that she needed. She came up to one of the workers that was on a ladder at about 11 at night and was adamantly trying to tell him something. The worker couldn't understand what she wanted and she got animate and left. The supervisor spent the next hour looking for her to ask, but he couldn't find her. I told him no one should be in the past building, past six, at the latest, but especially the few office women that worked at the building. I told the security guard to check on them later and asked if anyone had come in the night throughout the gates. No one had. The next day, the security guard told me that he had found them all eating lunch outside in the cold. The guard told me it was because of the lady. She'd come again and they couldn't find her. The guard spent an hour looking, nothing. The supervisor repeated the same story. She'd come up to another guy on a ladder and said the same thing happened. The third day, the guard told me that they were eating lunch in their cars because it was raining. I knew there were several lunch rooms there. He told me he wasn't looking anymore. When I spoke to the supervisor, he said he'd seen from a distance the woman talking to the worker on a ladder. He started walking towards her, and she walked away and opened an electrical panel about 20 feet away, and walked into it and disappeared. After the third night, they wouldn't speak of it again. This has been going on for over a year now. It started in February of 2020 on a Friday night. I went to bed around 11 and woke up in the middle of the night. I reached over to grab my phone to see the time and it was 2.59. Then a second later it ticked 3am and in that moment I had a vision of a small child standing at my bedroom door. I quickly reached over to turn the lights on and every hair on my body stood up. 
I was truly terrified as I pulled a pistol from my nightstand and got up. I walked to my door and peeked around the corner, and the child ran down the hall and hid in the kitchen. I slowly walked towards the kitchen, turning on lights as I went, and when I got to the kitchen, the child ran and hid in the bathroom. It was like a game of hide and seek, but I never went to the bathroom to look. I went back to my room and stayed up the rest of the night. At 7am I called my brother and told him what happened, and he said it was all in my head, and just to forget about it. I went about my day and didn't think much of it until I got home. I could feel something watching me from that bathroom. I was uneasy all evening and kept telling myself it wasn't real. I went to my room and fell asleep. I woke up again in the middle of the night and reached over to look at my phone, and deja vu. It was 3am and the vision hit me hard, a child standing just around the corner of my bedroom door. Just like the night before, I got up and the child ran towards the kitchen. I slowly walked, turning on lights and when I got to the kitchen, the child hid in the bathroom. I went back to my room and stayed up all night again. I never felt terror like that ever, and I've never had a paranormal experience or even believed ghosts were real. At around 7am, I called my mother and told her what happened the last two nights. She quickly said to stop joking around and asked if I talked to my grandmother. I told her I wasn't joking and I was truly terrified and no, I didn't talk to grandma. She told me that grandma woke up just after 3am last night to a little girl crying in the hallway. I froze in fear, thinking what the heck is going on and told mom I'll call her back and that I was going to call my brother. I called my brother and he answered saying, I knew you were going to call. He said he had the worst nightmare of his life. In his dreams he woke up and heard a noise in the basement so he walked downstairs. When he got to the bottom of the stairs, the basement started filling up with water so he turned around to go back up and on the stairs was a little girl. Her hair was flowing in front of her face, reaching out for him trying to smother him with her hair. He woke up and screamed mom. I could feel the fear in his voice. I told him that the exact same thing happened to me again and that grandma woke up to a child crying too. We all had an experience with a little girl in three different homes on the same night and this is just the beginning. I got in my truck and had to drive about an hour to look at a job. I'm a hardwood flooring contractor. My mother, brother and I were group texting trying to figure out what was going on. My mother's a very religious person and she started to pray. Then she said she knows a woman who's involved in this paranormal stuff and called her. A few minutes later, she was in our group text telling us what to do. She told us to call upon Archangel Michael and Gabriel to bring the child to the light. At this point, I'm about 30 minutes into my drive and I start praying, telling the girl to go to the light. Then I felt a breath on the back of my neck and I clenched my steering wheel and screamed from the top of my lungs. I continued to pray out loud and I said, go to the light, Aliona. Without even a thought, I actually said a name. I started shaking so bad, I had to pull over on the side of the highway. I'm not sure how it's spelled, but the name I said was Aliona. I'm 36 years old and I've never been so terrified in my life. Later that day when I got home, I asked my mother to meet me there and pray with me. And then we did the same thing at my brother's house and my mother's place. That evening, I called a friend who is Native American and told her what was going on. She told me to cleanse the house and smudge it. I've never heard of smudging before, but I would try anything to make this go away. I went to my room and finally fell asleep with the lights on. I had a nightmare and woke up in the middle of the night. In the dream, I saw a woman standing over a bathtub and a small girl laying on her back in the tub full of water. The woman put her hands on the child's chest and pushed her under the water. The girl's head drifted over her face when she was submerged. I stayed up the rest of the night, just froze in my bed, completely numb. When I finally got out of bed around 6am, I walked into the living room and both my computer monitors turned on. I stood, staring at the monitors, thinking an image was going to appear, but nothing happened. I then started to think that this girl was asking for help to solve her murder and I needed to do research on the computer. I had to go to work so I walked over and turned the monitors off. I began to pray, saying please find someone else to do this. My brain doesn't comprehend this kind of stuff and it really messes with me. 
I then started walking to the girl and said, please don't show yourself to me and I will help. It's Monday and I subcontracted a job about 30 minutes away in the country and I've never met the customers. When I got to the job, a man with long white hair was standing outside his, abo his adobe style home. I got out of the truck and he started talking to me like we were best friends. He told me to come inside and when he opened the front door, his wife was standing there. She was Native American and behind her was a shrine of Indian artifacts. In my head, I was like, what the fuck is going on? My life is turning into a horror movie. On the shrine was a big abalone shell with a bundle of sage. I pointed to it and asked if this was for smudging and that yesterday evening I talked to a friend that told me about burning sage. She said yes and then asked me what was wrong. I told them everything that had been happening and it was odd how good I felt around them. After talking for a few minutes, they showed me the two rooms that were getting floored and said they had to run a few errands in town. When they left, I was working in the back room and I saw two cats playing in the living room. At the same time, the cat stopped and both looked towards the bathroom and then ran and jumped in the tub. From the room, I couldn't see into the bathroom, but I could hear the shower curtain moving. I jumped up and ran outside until the customers got back. When I was standing by my truck, I started Googling paranormal investigators and paristers. This was seriously affecting me in my work and I needed help. I glanced at the house and I could see the girl's hair flowing out of the bathroom window. When they got back, I had my cooler out, acting like I was eating lunch, and I didn't tell them what happened when they were gone. At the end of the day, the woman grabbed the abalone and sage off the shelf and gave it to me. When I got home, the first thing I did was light the sage and walk the whole house while saying a prayer. I immediately felt like a huge weight was lifted from me. I felt amazing. I got on the computer and began to search for anything about an accidental drowning and a girl named Aliona. I also wrote a few emails to the Colorado Paranormal Society and tried contacting pastors. I spent the whole evening searching about this girl but I couldn't find anything. I went to bed feeling good but I could still feel that the girl was in the bathroom. I woke up in the middle of the night to my dog jumping on me and growling towards the bedroom door. Once again, I stayed up the rest of the night, just frozen in fear. I've hardly slept in days and I was mentally drained. At around 8am, I got a call from one of the priests I left a message for. I told him everything and that I feel like this was a child who was murdered, but her death ruled accidental. He told me it was the devil's trick and it wasn't my place to help her. Then he said a prayer and hung up. No one else has responded to my emails or messages and nothing's changed. She's with me 24 seven, anywhere I go, she's right there in the bathroom or hiding just behind a corner. My brother and grandmother haven't had anything else happen to them. It's been just over a year now and I'm still being tormented every day. I've tried contacting people and talking to anyone who will listen, but I still have no answers. The visions are so bad and real that it physically hurts. There's a lot more that has happened, but this was how it all started. I'm reaching out to anyone that might have answers. My friends and I have always been quite fond of going out urbex exploring. For those of you that don't know what that is, that's when you go out and look for abandoned and derelict buildings to explore and photograph. We didn't go out searching for the haunted side of things, we just enjoyed the eeriness and also the beauty of old, abandoned places. Living in Scotland, a lot of these abandoned places are normally surrounded by amazing scenery, from hills and mountains to thick forests and lush fields, so we always made a day out of it when we did go exploring. One house in particular was our favourite, so much so that we had already visited a couple of times prior to this experience. Myself and two of my best friends, we'll call them C and B, decided to go back, but the condition of the place had declined quite rapidly since the last time we'd been, and everything seemed very unstable, but we didn't let that stop us. Finding that our usual entry spots had been boarded up, we felt quite defeated, but decided to look for another entry anyway. 
After searching around for a while, we noticed that the roof on one of the lower parts of the house had been damaged by fire and was practically all gone. It wasn't the easiest to get up to, using a tree and each other to do so, but we finally got in. It was going relatively normal. We were wandering around the inside, searching and admiring the rooms we could still get into, being terrified by the occasional bird being spooked by our footsteps and taking photos of the amazing architecture. However, something was different this time. The whole place felt off and a little more eerie than it normally did. I've always been what would you describe as spiritually inclined, so I felt this more than what my other friends did. One of them was a complete skeptic, so he just brushed it off and said we were over-exaggerating and making things up. His mind was going to be completely changed after leaving this house. After exploring the top three floors as much as we could, cringing at the spray paint art the vandals had left, we were on the ground floor just having a chat and discussing how much the house's condition had really declined. We were standing in one of the hallways, almost in a triangle formation. I was standing in a door frame with my back towards the empty room with C to my left and B to my right. I was still feeling a little uneasy, but I didn't give much thought to it. As we were all conversing about the plans for the rest of the day, I felt something on my back. It felt like someone had run their hand down my back. From the base of my neck to the center of my back, I felt a firm, consistent pressure until the pressure tapered off down to the base of my back. It was over within seconds. I felt all the color drain from my face as I frantically jumped forward with a scream. B and C both looked at me in confusion and asked what happened and if I'd hear myself. In a haze of confusion and dizziness, I wasn't able to form any words, never mind describing what I just felt. I regained my bearings and took a couple of deep breaths before trying my best to explain the sensation of being touched. B's face turned a little pale as she saw how serious I was being. However, C was a skeptic. He laughed and thought I was joking or that I'd accidentally hit something without realizing or a bug had hit me. I knew that wasn't the case because for a split second before it happened, I felt every single hair on my body stand up as a warning to what was about to happen. Being slightly freaked out, B and myself managed to convince C that it was time to leave. On top of what had just happened, it was also getting a little cold. While making our way to the same section we had entered through, I started to feel a burning sensation run down my back, like someone had taken hot coals or a flame down my back. Starting to freak out again, I asked B to check if anything was there, asking her what was wrong. I automatically knew something was wrong because she didn't give a response. She was just silent. Next thing I knew, B was calling over C to come and look, which made my anxi anxiety spike up more. From the look on C's face, I became increasingly worried. They both nervously told me that there were marks going down my back. Obviously not being able to see my back myself, I then asked them to take a photo for me to see. Looking at the photo, there were three distinctive scratches going down my back exactly where I'd felt someone or something touch me. At first, C was convinced I'd done it myself or call myself on something. But after examining the scratches more, he determined that it couldn't have been. The scratch went under my bar, bra strap, which would have been impossible for me to do without them noticing. At this point, we're all trying to keep our calm while internally freaking out. We tried to make our way out as quick as we could without injuring ourselves. Climbing back over the wall of the house and through the hole where the roof used to be, we collectively walked a few weeks away from the house and stopped to look at it. Still trying to understand what had just happened, we all agreed that we'd go back to the car and never come back there. The walk back to the car, which took around 20 minutes, was relatively uneventful. Apart from a continuous uneasy feeling that we were being watched or followed and occasionally thinking that we could hear footsteps behind us, it was actually quite peaceful, taken in the Scottish countryside. We got to the car where we sat and had a smoke, still trying to completely calm ourselves down. It's safe to say that after that day, C took a long time to process the events, but undoubtedly became a believer. We swore to never come back to this house, but for some reason, we're always drawn back to it. It's like an urge to come back and visit. Like an itch that you can't quite scratch. Maybe we're just drawn in by the eeriness or the mystery around that day. 
Or maybe it's something more than that. Mm -hmm.